and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Siege of Trebolin, and I'm joined by my fellow writers, starting with Dirk Ashton. I am Dirk Ashton, author of the Paternus Trilogy. Michael R. Fletcher. Uh, hi, that's me, author of, I don't know, uh, some books. It's, it's too early for this shit. <laughs> and Rob J. Hayes. Hello, I'm Rob J. Hayes, author of Titan Hoppers, the progression Out science now. fantasy which released yesterday, although by the time Ooh. this airs it will probably be like last week or something. Yeah, that's yeah. about right. Yeah. I got my copy. <laughs> that book looks sick. We're gonna do, we should definitely do an episode talking about that uh, a bit more in more detail yeah. later because that looks really cool. Um, yeah. But today we are joined by a very special guest, Mike <sighs> Kerry. Mike, welcome to the show. Uh, th- thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, Mike, just for readers and listeners who might not be familiar with your work, do you want to just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you've written over the years? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I write comics, um, I write uh, novels and short stories, I write screenplays, occasionally uh, occasionally other stuff like radio plays and game, uh, game scripts. Uh, started out mainly writing comics, and I'm probably still best known for Lucifer at, at, uh, at DC Vertigo. Uh, but uh, in prose fiction, I'm uh, best known for The Girl with All the Gifts, a, a zombie novel with uh, a cute little girl zombie as the, as the protagonist, which was filmed with Gemma Arterton and Senya Nanaman. Fantastic. Um, and yeah, you have, uh, we're going to be talking about <laughs> sort of writing comics and graphic novels in this episode, but I think the thing that really stood out to me the most when I was kind of doing research for this is just how much stuff you've written over the years. Like, how are you so prolific? Because you've probably written like hundreds of things. It's crazy. Yeah, um, I think I think uh, my, my 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 secret weapon there is um, is insecurity. Uh, as soon as I <laughs> as, soon, as soon as I gave up teaching, I, yeah, I was a teacher for fifteen years and was just writing around the edges of that. As soon as I gave up the day job, which was back in nineteen ninety nine. Uh, I immediately sort of felt like I'd fallen off the edge of a cliff. You know, that uh, the, the the first month when a salary check didn't come in, I started to panic, and I don't think I've ever really stopped. Um, so, so I'm always deck is still holding up my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I, 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 I just um, I'm always looking for the job after next and the job after that. I'm always sort of like um, uh, trying to drum up work. Uh, I never say no to work, or almost never. So yeah, it's 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 pure panic. Panic is a is a is a great uh, great incentive, a great motivator. Uh, other Mike and Rob, can you guys speak a bit to that as full time writers? <laughs> is that oh yeah, something it's that motivates nonstop you as well? panic. You just <laughs> each month you look at your Amazon sales and think, oh fuck, come on, buy books, <laughs> come on, do it. Yeah. What about you, Funny Rob? Enough, that's exactly why you sort of like you, yeah, you keep writing because you're like, well, yeah, okay. Sales have dropped a little bit, so maybe I should write another book. Um, and then before you know it, you have like six series on the go at the same time, and you have no idea what you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, uh, that's the that's 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 the challenge, isn't it? The sort of like keeping multiple things on the go, trying mm. trying to sort of mix and match, match deadlines, especially you know writing in different media because they all have their different sort of life cycles and periodicities. What did you start with, Mike? Uh, I mean, you've done comics, you've done, do you do short, short stories also? Yeah, I've got one, one collection of short stories out. Um, oh, I've written maybe, I didn't. Maybe 20. It, it, I don't it, have yes, that. Publishing. It, was a, it was a very, very small limited edition um, by a boutique published by a really, really, really good small indie publisher in the UK, PS, PS Publishing. Uh, um, I, will I started have to look out. For that. I started out doing comics journalism. I started out writing reviews and articles for fanzines. And then oh. at a certain point, I started, uh, I, I got to know some guys who were editing comics through that. So I pitched, I pitched some stuff to them. Um, you probably don't remember a very, very short-lived British comic called Toxic. Toxic with an exclamation mark. It lasted for 31 issues between, I think, 1990 and 1991. Uh, it was set up in, as a rival to 2000 AD, and they didn't do their sums right, and they went bankrupt very fast. But in the, in the brief period when they existed, I pitched, I pitched two books to them. Um, one was a, a psychological horror called Legions of Hell, and the other was um, a superhero story that was shamelessly ripped off from Watchmen. 
which was called uh, <laughs> Aquarius. And they, they, um, they commissioned both, and then they went out of business. They, 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 oh. they, they went bankrupt, which was, uh, which was kind of a um, – that was um, setting the tone for things to come. There was, there, was, <laughs> there, was a point, there was a point back there where if any small publisher hired me, they just immediately – um, hit the tube. <laughs> uh, what, yeah, what, 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 jo- what Jonah did to shipping, I did to independent publishing. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that had that had to be tough. I mean, a lot of people would have just given up, you know, after one or yeah. two, just one of those, let alone a couple. So it was tough. I mean, I, I, I guess it was just a hobby back then. I mean, it was it was it was always depressing when uh, when I thought I got a. A foot in the door, or thought I got something published, and then the publisher died. But it was just something I was doing around the edges of teaching. It was not a career, and I didn't think it ever would be a career. Um, so I, I worked my way through. So after after Toxic and Apocalypse Press over here, uh, I went to Malibu just before they were bought out by Marvel and ceased trading. I worked for Caliber in the last days of Caliber, um, but. That was kind of a turning point. The stuff I did for Caliber was um, was much more significant than I thought it was. They didn't pay me, you know. Most of the time, they uh, they, they they would they they had this um, this charming policy that they would only pay for a book if it went into profit. So you'd oh. you'd write your script, you'd write your script and send it in, and then they'd say, wow. "Yeah, we uh, we took a bath on that one, so we're not paying you." Um, <laughs> but they did bring the books out, and the, and the the um the production values were really good they were really really solid black and white books on good paper stock so i i started to build up a portfolio and i started to send stuff into vertigo uh, specifically i sent them into elisa quitney who was editing sandman at the time i sent so many begging letters to elisa <laughs> quitney it was incredible just you know, please 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 let me work for you and then one day she wrote back um and that was sort of that, that was sort of my big break. Although it was two years, another two, another, another two years before I got any work commissioned at DC. But that was where I started to build up a relationship there. And was that what led to you working on Lucifer? Because I'd really love to talk about that. Eventually, it did. Yeah. So what happened was, Elisa wrote to me and said, um, "You know, it, it's great that uh, it's great that you've been sending me your stuff. It's great that you finally." Uh, figured out that you should send a return address um <laughs> why don't you pitch some she she she, she uh yeah i know I, I, I did so many things wrong but she um she said they were she said they were they were, they were going to launch the dreaming as a kind of uh, continuation of the sandman universe and she invited me to pitch stories for that and i spent two years um doing that like pitching doing one page and two page pitches for the dreaming and then um caitlin keenan took it over as a, a continuity book so elisa said that that that's off the table now um and i just sort of uh drifted back into limbo for a while but then i, I did a book at uh, caliber called dr faustus which is an adaptation of the uh the christopher marlowe play um oh. dr faustus but just a, a retelling of the faust legend that's a bit more upfront about the um the homosexual the, the gay the gay subtext uh which is which i think is definitely there in marlowe's work so in, in this it becomes a kind of um uh, almost like a a love triangle between faustus his servant wagner and the demon mephistopheles um and Alisa sort of picked that up off the slush pile and she called me again. And this time she said that they were starting Sandman Presents and they needed somebody to do a Lucifer script. But the thing is, they'd already, they'd already hired a writer and they'd already, um, they already had a sort of like a, um, a script for issue one. And then they, they'd cashiered the writer. It was Elizabeth Hahn. They, 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 they greenlit the script and then they decided very late in the day that um, although it was a really good script, it wasn't a good vehicle for Lucifer or some, somebody at DC felt that. So they, at the last moment, they wanted to go with a different writer. She called me up and she said, do you want to do this? And I said, yes. She said, you, you're going to have to want it badly because we need uh, a pitch in 48 hours and we probably need the first script <laughs> with, within, within a fortnight. Um, so I just, yeah, just didn't sleep that weekend, uh, hammered out the, uh, the kind of pitch for what became Morningstar Option, sent it in. Wow. Elisa yeah. liked it, Karen liked it, Neil Gaiman liked it, uh, which was crucial because he was the script consultant on yes. all of those Sandman projects. Um, and they, they, they gave me the, uh, the green light. That's and awesome. what was that process? First of all, that is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
I, w- I really wanted to know a little bit about how you approach working in another writer's universe or other writer's universes. Because I think with The Sandman, you know, what I love so much about that comic and that series is the kind of unique tone of Neil Gaiman's world building in that original series. And I'm really curious yeah. to know how you are able to kind of capture enough of that original ethos when you're doing your own take on it, but also have your own unique voice that you're bringing into it as well. So what is that process sort of like? And you can talk about other comics where you've worked in shared universes before if you want. I was I was a lot younger uh, back then and I was brash and stupid. Um, and it never occurred to me to be afraid that I was I was following I was following Neil. I just thought, you know, this is this is gonna this is gonna be the most fun I'm ever gonna have in my life. I was a sure. huge Sandman fan. I I, I I was obsessive about Sandman because I felt and I still feel I, th- I still think this is true that Sandman had done something in long form storytelling in comics that hadn't been done before. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, in in a way it picks up on what Al- sorry in a way it picks up on what Alan Moore was doing in um, uh, in Swamp Thing, but I think mm. it takes it further. Um, yeah, it's it's a novelistic approach. Over the over the seven years that he was writing Sandman, uh, he basically told one story, but he but he wove it wove it together out of many many different threads using the long arcs and the done in one issues to kind of strike sparks off each other. And a lot of those a lot of those sort of freestanding stories seemed to be independent of the main story, and then they would mm. feed in from unexpected angles later on. I'd never seen that done before. I don't think it ever had been done before in a mainstream book. Um, so I just thought, well, I'm going to get me some of that. Uh, all I ever did with Lucifer to start, to, to start with, and I think, I think you can definitely see this in the first year of the book. That was me doing Neil, me just pastiching Neil. Um, it took me quite a while to sort of like, um, to build up the confidence to, to sort of like deviate from that script. So, so I think it's coming back to your question. I think I'm, I'm always, um, kind of. I, I come from a position where I'm very respectful of continuity. You can see it in my X Men. You can see it in my Hellblazer. Um, you know, in Hellblazer, I took I took a lot of the characters that had been created during Warren Ellis's very brief run on the book uh, and brought them back into the spotlight. On X Men, I took a whole bunch of B list and C list characters that nobody seemed to want to use and sort of brought them forward again. Um, so I. I I guess I, I really enjoy I really enjoy the challenge of um, working in continuity in somebody else's universe and sort of finding a new angle to come in at that doesn't destroy or disrespect what's already there. Um, in some in some cases, I, th- I, th- I think it was when I was running Hellblazer, someone said on the um, the Straight to Hell forum, "This is like reading Hellblazer fan fiction. It's it's so indebted to continuity. It it." it it's kind of it's kind of strange, and so I think that's that's, that's the downside of the way I, <laughs> the, way I the way I do it. Yes. Um, but I, but I'll, I'll always I'll always do it immersively. I'll always start by reading everything that's there, which which with X Men was a was an incredible technical challenge because mm. oh, there were yeah. about there were about five five thousand issues of X Men related material, most oh of which gosh. was I mean uh, either either unavailable or stupidly expensive. Um, and Mar- Marvel would not routinely send you um, stuff from that back catalogue. If you needed a specific issue, they could send you a, a scan of it. But mostly, what I did there was um, there was there was a guy on eBay who was selling bootleg CDs <laughs> of uh, you know com- com- complete runs of Uncanny, complete runs of New Mutants, complete runs of Adjectiveless X Men. So I bought those, feeling dirty as I did it, <laughs> read them, r- read read them, and then destroyed them. Um, because it was the only only practical way yes. to get that uh, to get to get that material. Wow! I mean, these days these days there are there are websites where you could go and uh, mm. you know, they're, they're just as sleazy and, and read them there. But at the time, it was it was that or nothing. Yeah. And are you taking notes while you're reading through it? Or are you just reading it, trying to like pick up on the the vibe of it? Is there any like kind of tactics that you're using to better understand that world and better try to craft your own approach to? telling a story with it yeah i do i do take notes as i go um and then as, I, as i'm sort of working towards uh the actual story my notes take on a very odd form uh which is the the form of a catechism i i, I ask myself questions and then i answer the questions and then i ask myself follow-up questions and i do that i do that sort of like in actual writing yeah you know, it, it it's 
weird and schizophrenic and uh, <laughs> it's hard to ex it's hard to explain why it works but it does work for me so could you give a uh, quick ask, example ask the of, and answer. could you just give like a quick example of what that might look like say for yeah so, so it'd be like um what what if we um what if we brought back some of the characters from the acolytes which ones would we use um what would exodus's um motivation be in the post house of m um x-men universe and then i'll sort of like write a few paragraphs on that and now i'll pick a fight with myself and say but that doesn't work so, <laughs> sounds so familiar it's, it's it's it do you, you do that too though oh yeah i think we all do just question except for mike fletcher he, he he just knows what he's doing all the time he just writes perfection yeah, on the just, first go yeah flawless he just sits drafts. down and just flows fuck, fuck, from fuck, beginning fuck, to fuck, end fuck, and it's just like that he never has any anxiety or <laughs> no yeah it's constant yeah and you know it's funny you said you like you made a lot of mistakes at the beginning we're all self-pub authors and that's all we do <laughs> I would, as, as we an just make mistake mistake mis after mistake <laughs> as an example um, of the kind of mistakes i was making i was sending i was sending pitches to karen berger for superhero comics when she was editing when she was senior editor at vertigo and had nothing to do <laughs> with the superhero books at all whoops <laughs> i sent i sent a uh an email to uh lindsey hall and and referred to orbit, even though she had already been out of orbit and at tour for like uh, a year and a half. It's like, oops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so well, it's not just me. Yeah, I, to be honest, I, I want to ask, this is going to sound like a really basic question, but I have no idea how comics and the like work. Um, so when you say yeah. you're sort of like, you're, you're pitching a comic, like you're not, you're not doing the, the, the drawing, you're sort of just writing the story no. of, of the comic. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, yeah, I, I I can't I can't draw to save my life. Although having <laughs> said that, you usually usually I do draw when when I'm scripting. I start show you. I've got I've got one. Ooh. I've got one that's sitting right here. Oh, this cool! Is a comic I'm doing at the moment. So I, I, that that's that's how I start scripting. I do I do these horrifically awful, uh, rudimentary stick figure drawings for each panel and i write the dialogue down the side and that's 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 how i that's how i start and then when i go to script i've made a lot of the creative decisions about page turns about camera angles mm. which, which dialogue goes with which with which image and if there are any structural problems they usually come out at that stage so it's a it's a really useful a really useful kind of halfway house the artist never gets to see that because <laughs> they, they they would they would they would just laugh at me and kick sand in my face. <laughs> they crucify you. Was, so are you providing the, I was directions wondering about for that because like, still. Oh, sorry, you, Rob, you go. I, I was just I was wondering because yep. I was wondering what the difference between sorry, the sort of like the the mediums of writing for comic and writing yeah. for like you know a book are because I've always looked mm. at comics as sort of um, they're almost like viewing a story through strobe lighting. You're just getting you know, an image here, an image there, <laughs> and rather than like um, a single flowing story. So I just wondered mm. how like how different it is to write for the two mediums. And you do, you do, uh, I mean, I was thinking about what you were just saying too, Mike. You, you, so you write basically, I'm a, I was a screenwriter uh, in the past. So there's a difference between a master scene script, which has no camera direction, has no, um, has nothing directorial. It's simply dialogue and action, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's a shooting script that the director usually writes where he goes in and puts in uh, uh, MCU, CU, uh, wide shot, establishing shot, you know, all these kinds of things and low angle, right. you know, those kinds of things. So you're actually doing closer to a shooting script. Yes, that's right. And when okay. I started to do screenwriting, I, I did. I, I approached screenplays as though they were comics, and I got uh, I got a lot of negative feedback about that. Yeah, but it's I mean, a known it's a no no if you're just writing a screenplay to put camera angles in. You, that's yeah. uh, one of the you're things doing, I really doing, have to hammer into my students. Don't do it because you're doing other people's jobs. Um, and they're, 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 I think I think they're legally mm. entitled. You know, the, the director can come find out where you live, come around, and beat you to death with the uh, <laughs> with, with the screenplay, and it's not technically homicide. Um, Book editors have the same deal. If you don't implement their changes; um, they come around. 
<laughs> so so yeah, when 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 you when you write a when you write a comic script, you are giving you know, the bulk of it is art direction. It's telling the artist what needs to be in the panels, um, and and giving them a map, a map to get through the story. Um, when I started writing out, I started out writing comics. There were only two comic scripts that were widely available. One of them was um, for the Calliope episode of Sandman, which was in the collection Dream Country. And the other one was the script for issue one of Watchmen, which was in the trade paperback collection of Watchmen. So unfortunately for me, I, I, I worked from the, uh, the Watchmen one. So I tried to write like Alan Moore. Huh. Um, and the, the, the snag with that is it only works for Alan Moore. It doesn't work for anybody else. <laughs> if you, if you, if you, I, don't, I don't know if you've, actually, if you've actually seen that script, but um, the first panel, the first panel is just a little smiley button with a little um, single drop of blood on it. Just one very simple image. The, the, the art direction for that single panel runs to a side and a half of closely typed A4. It's something like 750 words. Wow. It's, of just that's that astonishingly detailed that's yep. crazy and that's and that and that's that that's how he does it throughout he writes novelistically um huh. but he does it that he does it that way because you know he already has the page in his head he mm. knows exactly what effect what effect he's going for and he gives very very explicit directions for how to get there what i found um over the space of maybe two three years of writing comics was that if you're not Alan Moore, it's definitely the case that less is more. That that actually, what you need to tell the the artist is these things in the panel are important, so make sure you get those in. Or even mm. this is the effect. This is the effect I'm going for in this panel. So why don't you figure out a way to 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 do it? You know, you can be imagistic. You can be the, you can be telegraphic. If you look at a Michael Bendis, um, uh, Brian Brian Bendis script, uh, the, the the panel description might be just be close up Captain America, he's pissed or something like that. Yeah, that, that that's, that's all, that's all you get. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, you're, 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 you're giving a, a map, map of the story. You will often sort of say, you know, this, this panel is the most important on the page, or you'll say, I want this to be the page turn. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the time you're trusting the artist to find the visual solution for the story that you're telling. Cause, cause surprise, surprise, artists have better, visual imaginations than most what? the most writers do so, so, <laughs> so well, enough, I you, you, can, you tend to get, you tend <laughs> yeah most you tend to, you tend like, to get more than, than you ask for you tend to get better than you ask for it's like when uh no, go, go. when um uh i had um john do mike had john do the first the second uh cover for the Paterna series for Wrath of Gods. And he had uh in his sketches he had the main character in a man bun. And I'm like, that actually works really well <laughs> for that character. Um so I actually went back and <laughs> no changed one else ever. the description and and had him and had him put it up because it looks really cool on that particular character. Um so I actually changed it in the script, and I've done that before, or in the script, in the manuscript, and I've actually <laughs> done that probably three or four times based on what what artists come up with. Oh yeah, yeah, right. just about uh, stealing working. good ideas, right? Doesn't matter Infinite. if they come to editor or artist. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things that's uh, that's happened to me. If, sorry, sorry, Rob, I keep interrupting you. No, no, I, I think it's the. Um, uh, uh, video recording software we're using. It. Time, time Sometimes it's, it takes a while to come through. Well, one of one of the things that's happened to me a few times now is that um, I'll see I'll, I'll write a write a script, and there'll be a description of a character, and then when the when the the character sketches come back, the character looks really different, and immediately I I, I look at the sketches and I think I know how that character's voice works. A, a good example of that is Gaudium. There's this horrible little imp in Lucifer, Gaudium. He's one of the fallen cherubs. He looks like a gargoyle, um, and he talks like a New York cab driver. Um, <laughs> and that's that's kind of because when 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 Peter drew him, I thought, you know, I I, I could I could definitely see how that character would uh, would talk and act. And initially, he was just going to be in one issue. He was going to have a like a choric function. He was just going to tell tell another character something she needed to know. But he was so cool. We had to keep bringing him back, and he ended up getting. Like three issues of Lucifer all to himself. Huh. 
Nice. That's pretty cool. Fletcher, I was going to ask, did you have any any questions? It's all good if you don't, but I just realized I haven't given you a uh, No, no, yet. this is uh, very much a just listen and learn sort of episode for me. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're coming well, guess... close. We're coming close to the end of time on this, but I would love to ask you, Mike, if you can stick around, um, how you would approach if you were somebody like us and we thought, you know, maybe we'd like to adapt this to a graphic novel. If that's a really terrible idea, or how we would would do that. That's a great approach, question, it, or at least get started. And we probably mm-hmm. should do that in another episode. Or do you want to do that now, Jed? Um. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll break and we'll do that in next week's episode. If that sounds okay. Good. If that's all right okay. with you, Mike. Cool. What a yep, cliffhanger! Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, yes, there we go. To be continued. Um, <laughs> this has been amazing. Like, yeah. Mike, I feel like I could hear you talk for days. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. listening or watching. Uh, we'll be back next week, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, uh, and we'll continue this conversation with Mike Kerry. Um, also, just a special th- shout out to our latest patron. Uh, let me get their name up insert elevator music while the web page loads i should we have 32 people on patreon now which is pretty sick so thank you everybody for helping to support the show um i'm stalling <laughs> Stalling. Is it Steve? I bet it's Steve. Dude, distracting music. <laughs> while he while he's stalling, Steve. Mike, I I just want to tell you that uh I did pass on your uh email address to my sister and she goes, No, I can't email him. He'll think I'll be I'm fangirling. And I was like, I was like, every uh, time I, I he says, that's what I do every time I see Mike, I fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> No, it would be, it would and be this cool, is to, why. Uh, cool to talk. <laughs> All right. I've got the Patreon name up. So thank you everybody for, <laughs> for waiting. <laughs> um, so just want to shout out Ben Lee for joining the Patreon and also an extra special shout out to Talon, who has joined our uh, like highest tier legendary wizard level of our Patreon. Um, so awesome. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, if you want to check out the Patreon. Oh, there you go. Mike Carey's giving you a clap. So that's a bonus we didn't promise. <laughs> Delivering above and beyond. <laughs> Mike gave him the clap. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> <Sign of approval. laughs> I did not have to. <laughs> wow. Fletcher waits. There says nothing the entire episode and then as usual comes out with gold at the last second. Yeah. Yep. It's my Just job. like a classic that's writer. I'm here to look pretty Fantastic. and drop one-liners. <laughs> awesome. All right. We'll be back next week uh, and we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. If you want to help support the show and get access to exclusive episodes that you can't get anywhere else, head on over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Wizards Warriors Words, and you can find the link down below. And an extra special shout out to our high tier patron, Taylor.